If you have your Bibles, why don't you open up to Luke chapter 1. We are going to take a look at a story of waiting for joy this morning. How many of you guys feel joy? Anybody? Joy? Five people are excited. Okay, good. Well, for the rest of us, we need to be infused with a little bit of joy this morning. So, if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1. We're going to take a look at the story of Mary. And uh, last week, we, we were taking a look at the story of Joseph and what a stud he was. Poor Joseph hardly gets any lines in any Christmas plays. People, when they come up with a Christmas story, they're like, oh yeah, there's supposed to be a Joseph. Like, he doesn't even like make it in the, in the, in the realm of people's consciousness when it comes to the Christmas story. But actually, we looked, we looked at last week how if you really want to be a man of God, I mean, some of us, okay, we don't want to be a man of God. We just come here because our wives make us come or they nag us and we're just like, okay, I guess to be a good family man, I guess I'll have to come to church. But for those of us that really want to follow God, those of us that feel the pull, the draw of the love of God in our lives, and we want to be men of God, uh, we, we, we saw ourselves a little bit in Joseph last week. Now here's a man who had disappointment right from the beginning of his marriage, right? He gets married to Mary, oh, she's pregnant. Oh, great, and it's not mine. What am I going to do? I guess I'll divorce her quietly. And an angel has to come and say, hey, everything's all right. It's the Holy Spirit. First and only time in history a woman can actually say that. And we found out last week that Joseph was a man of God, that he loved God more than he loved himself. He loved God more than he loved the hurt in his own heart. He loved God more than anything else in the world. And so for us men in here, we saw a mirror of the kind of man that we strive to be. Not a perfect man, Joseph wasn't perfect, but a man that really wanted to love God. And this week we take a look at Mary, the other side of the coin, if you will, of a woman who an angel has to show up and go, guess what, ninth grader in high school, you're going to be pregnant. Really? Yep. Yep. Imagine being 13, 14, 15 years old, 16 years old, a ninth grader, 10th grade, those of us that have ninth, 10th grade daughters. That's a nightmare of our lives, is to have our daughter come home as a ninth grader and go, I'm pregnant. And we just go, are you kidding me? And that's exactly what we see in the Christmas story. You know what's funny about the Christmas story is... We go to Costco and get our nativity scenes or whatever, and they're plastic or carved out of wood. And uh, we set them up, and it's kind of a cute little story. But actually, this story is so, it's so organic. It's so, it's so dirty because it's real life. It's like if you were actually living this story, you would go, this doesn't even resemble the Christmas stories that we usually hear in church. Because there's so much anxiety and hurt and and issues like just like you and I have that we go wow these are like real people and so we're going to take a look at Mary this morning but how she overcomes all the issues in her life that God even brings into her life to find joy Luke chapter 1 we're going to start in verse 26 so in verse 26 up till this point in Luke chapter uh, chapter 1 the 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 angel has visited um, Mary's relative, Elizabeth. She's an older woman. Doesn't give her age, but she's past childbearing age. She may be in her 50s, maybe in her 60s, way past it's time to have a baby time. She's never had a child before. She's been barren her whole life. The angel shows up and, and says, guess what, old lady? You're going to have a child. And Elizabeth is like, are you crazy? There's a lot of craziness that goes on in this Christmas story. I mean, last week, Joseph's like, are you out of your mind? Right, a pregnant virgin, right, like that ever happens. And yet it was true. The angel shows up to Elizabeth, the old lady, beyond childbearing years, and goes, you're going to be pregnant. She goes, uh-huh, whatever. Now she is pregnant. She's found to be with child. She's six months along in verse 26, which is where we're going to start. So now the old lady is pregnant with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, watch this, if you didn't know this. Ready? I'm going to drop some new knowledge on you. John the Baptist is actually Jesus' cousin. 
So when John the Baptist comes preaching about, hey, the Messiah is coming, he's actually talking about his relative, Jesus. Because Mary, young Mary, is a relative to old Elizabeth. So in verse 26, we're going to pick up the story. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Gabriel's going to show up and t- drop some crazy knowledge to Mary right here. Ready? Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph in the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, I love verse 34, underline verse 34, or if you got an iPad, take your diamond ring out and scratch it right underneath this verse, ready? It's going to be there forever. How can this be since I am a Parthenos? How can this be since I am a virgin? And in the Greek, it, it, it means, how can this be since I don't know a man? And in the Hebrew, that was a Hebraic way of saying, I don't know a man. I have not been close to a man. So how can, how can I become pregnant if I have not known a man? Imagine you're Mary. An angel shows up to speak to you. Mary is so amazed that she says, how can this be since I don't know a man? I love that Mary has some wits about her. Because for most of us, if an angel shows up, we go, holy, what's going on? But Mary actually questions the angel. And this is what the angel says. Verse 35. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child, will be born, uh, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age. She has also conceived a son, and she is in her sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Underline verse 38. This is why Mary was chosen. God is about ready to come into Mary's life and wreck her life. Many of us thought, hey, when I came to know Jesus, I thought everything was going to be awesome. Once I thought, I'm going to... I'm going to finally get my life straight with God. Everything's going to go great from here. Guess what? God shows up in your life and he wrecks your shop. You want to know why? Because the life you've been living up till this point, there's a reason God had to step into your life. If your life was so godly and great before, God wouldn't have to step in because you were that amazing. But guess what? When God steps in, he goes, guess what? It's like somebody walking into your house and going, I don't want that there. I don't want that there. Imagine if I showed up to your house and started picking your couch up. I want it over here. Take your TV off the wall. Put it on this wall. God comes into your life and just starts rearranging everything. And guess what? Some of that rearranging is painful. Because some of those things are habits that we've done for years. Things that we learned from our own parents. And when God comes in, we think, oh, I'm following God now. So I'm not going to have any anxiety. There's no issues. Everything's going to go great. But when God shows up, we go, you know what? Seems to me I have more problems than I have before. Seems to me my anxiety level is higher in some areas than it was before. Seems to me my character all of a sudden has all these flaws I never noticed before. All of a sudden, I realize I'm a greater jerk than I ever was in my whole life, and now I'm a Christian. Why is that? Because guess what? When the great light of God shines into your darkness, you're going to see some ugliness in the darkness. When you and I walked in the darkness of our ignorance before God, everything was dark. So in the dark, everything's the same, right? The good, the bad, everything's the same in the dark. But man, once light comes on, you're like, whoa, whoa, time out. I need some work done. Because light exposes, right? Watch this. Mary, a woman of God, a young woman of God. You would think if she was going to follow God, things would go well. God shows up and goes, guess what? I'm going to wreck your life. I'm going to make you 
a pregnant virgin in a culture where if you were found pregnant before you were actually made it to your wedding day, they'd put you to death. It's not like our culture where it's like, oh, I guess we need to buy some baby clothes. In that culture, it was like, oh, you're going to screw around? You couldn't wait till you were married? You have no self-control? Well, we're going to teach you a little self-control with these rocks. It was that kind of culture. Because the purity of the sexual union was known as something that could, should only be expressed in marriage because it was given from God. You were actually abusing a gift from God of your sexuality. That was why it was a big deal. So God comes into Mary's life. Imagine your ninth, ninth grade daughter. God comes to her and says, guess what? He sends an angel and says, uh, you're going to be pregnant. Now everyone is going to assume that you're lying when you say, this angel showed up. But I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to walk you through this time. And guess what Mary says? Mary says, behold. Some of your translations says the handmaid of the Lord. You know what that word is in Greek? It's the word doulos, which is the word for slave. She says, behold the slave of the Lord. Do whatever you need to do. I am yours. I belong to you, God. Can you imagine that as a young lady saying that? I know that people are going to look at me and go, oh, you're kind of that kind of girl. Oh, I understand. But I'm willing to do whatever. I'm willing to take shame for you, Jesus. I'm willing to take shame for you, God. Number one, Gabriel is sent to Mary. Gabriel is sent to Mary. The angel Gabriel, and his Hebrew me, uh, name means mighty man of God or Gabriel, is sent by God to a a poor, probably teenage Jewish girl named Mary living in a small agricultural town of Nazareth. So basically, Gabriel shows up to Hemet, to some teenage girl in Hemet. It's like God sends Gabriel to, to Hemet and goes, I want you to go down to Hemet. I want you to talk to this girl named Mary. She's living in this poor little place in a little shack out on a, uh, on a farm. I want you to tell her that she's going to be pregnant. God's going to be coming. He's going to use her body to bring the God-man into history. Imagine, so now we're here in Temecula, and we hear about this pregnant uh, lady in, this pregnant girl in Hemet, who claims to have been visited by an angel. And all of us in Temecula go, oh, that's what happens in Hemet. <laughs> right? Gary's from Hemet, so that's why I'm picking on Hemet today. Right? Because, I mean, everybody in Jerusalem goes, oh, oh, Nazareth. Nazareth is like a one-horse town where you go, I know weird things happen in Nazareth. That's a weird little spot. But God picks a young woman of God in a small little one-horse town to bring about his glory because she has the heart to follow God no matter what. Six months previously, Gabriel appeared to the elderly priest, Zechariah, when he was performing priestly duties in the temple to tell him he would have a child. Zechariah's child was to be John the Baptist, who would become the forerunner of the ministry of Jesus. But before this visitation to Zechariah, Gabriel had appeared 500 years earlier to Daniel. In your book of Daniel, we see Gabriel shows up to talk to, uh, we see Gabriel shows up to talk to Daniel. So imagine this, you're Gabriel, all you do is the will of God. Gabriel, I need you to go down and talk to that guy in Daniel in Babylon. You're gone. Talk, 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 talk to Daniel. Hey, hang in there. I know it's going to be kind of crazy and weird. Hang in there. You're back to heaven. You hang around, whatever angels do for hundreds of years. Go down to Nazareth. Talk to that, to that uh, thir- you know, 15-year-old girl. You're gone. Down into Nazareth. One horse town. You're like, well, this town's really weird. You get down there. You get to talk to a young lady. Hey, guess what? You're going to be pregnant. But I don't know a man. Guess what? The Holy Spirit, he's going to overshadow you. He's going to come upon you and, and, and create inside of you uh, a son who's going to be known as the Most High. Got it? Are we all good? Okay. Go on. The angel's job is a messenger. He's like those guys in New York that ride the bikes. <laughs> all they do is just run around with packages and drop packages off. Where am I going now? Ride a bike, ride a bike, ride a bike. Cut through traffic. You know, it's like Gabriel sent... Gabriel never ages, because he's not like you and me. He's outside of time and space. So the same Gabriel that shows up to Daniel, 500 years later, shows up to, to Mary. 
He's a messenger that gets sent when he's told by God. Though there's not much information on the interaction of angels with the world, the Bible describes angels as created spiritual beings that do not age or die. Angels primarily are messengers sent to do the will of God on earth. The Greek word for sent, when you send somebody, is apostello, and this is the basis of the word apostle, which means a sent one like the apostle Paul. Believers like angels are sent ones to joyfully tell of the greatness of God and the good news of his love for humanity. When's the last time you told somebody about the greatness of God? Last night? A week ago? You can't even remember? Let me, let me ask you something. If you're, if you're a Christian, I'm not saying if you go to church, I'm saying if, you, if Jesus actually changed your life, when is the last time that you actually told somebody, Jesus is amazing? Jesus transformed who I am. Just when is the last time you did that? Think about it in your own head. Many of us, we can't even think of a time we've done that. Well, let me ask you this then. If Jesus really transformed your life, then really what difference has he made? Because if something really changed my life, you get excited about it. You want to know why? Watch an infomercial sometime. You know what it is? It's all testimonials. You wouldn't believe it. I put this cleaner on my floor. My dog had vomited, and this person came in and put crayon on my carpet, and there was all this stuff piled on there, and all of a sudden, I put this little cleaner on there, and it was like magic. It disappeared. Our carpet was like new. I snuggled with it with my own face. I mean, there are all these testimonials about things. The infomercials are like, you cannot live one more minute unless you buy this cleaner. If you don't buy this cleaner, you are a loser, because this cleaner will transform your life. And you're sitting there watching that going, I gotta, I gotta get some cleaner. You like go to your, you know, you gotta put it on pause on TiVo or whatever. You're like, oh, with one eight hundred, clean me. You know, whatever the, whatever the one eight hundred number is. It's like if you call now, nineteen ninety five. You're like nineteen ninety five. I'd pay four hundred and thirty dollars for a cleaner that could do all that. The whole point of the infomercial is they they. They interview people, and they get testimonials from people to go, this is so amazing, if you don't get this, your, your life is basically over. <laughs> this cleaner is the best thing that will ever happen to your life. I know you have children that were great, but this cleaner is greater than your children. <laughs> You're like, I got it. Oh, I'm going to get rid of my kids so I can get some more cleaner in my life. <laughs> the whole point of the infomercial is to, is to get you to be influenced to go, you know what, that thing's amazing. All those people, they wouldn't lie to me. They're telling me the truth. That, 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 that's an amazing product. And I wonder for how many of us, God has sent us to go tell people about him. Okay, so you're not an upfront person. Okay, you're not going to be the one that's standing on the corner going, get some Jesus in your life with a you know, banner or whatever. But here's my point. God has already sent you to your family. God has already sent you to your coworkers or the people in your groups that you hang out with. God's already sent you to them. You're already an apostle to those groups. When is the last time you said, you need to get to the orchard, man, because we love Jesus? When is the last time you said, Jesus has so transformed my life that I got to tell you about him? You should be a walking infomercial for Jesus. You should be a walking infomercial that says, forget the cleaner. Forget everything else in your life. Jesus will transform who you are. You should not live one more minute unless Jesus has done in your life what he's done in my life. For many of us that Jesus has done that, why in the world haven't we told somebody? It's been years for some of us that we've even opened our mouth and said, Jesus is amazing. Come find out about him. Think about it this way. Like, like Don said at the, at the offering, we have literally doubled in, in uh, it was about six months when we started doubling. Getting to the point where you almost couldn't find two, three, four seats together. Now, we, and then we had to go to two services. For many of us, if we invited one friend, do you realize we'd have to go to like four services? Because we would triple our doubled services. We would almost quadruple our doubled services. And my point being to you is that you have to be involved in the work of God. Just like angels are sent, go, Gabriel, go, Gabriel, go, Gabriel, go, go again. You and I are sent. And sometimes I wonder, we spend our whole lives working. 
We spend our whole lives just looking for fun and entertainment, which that's not sin in and of itself, but man, if Jesus is greater than all these things, then why in the world don't we put some energy and some love into bringing Jesus into people's lives? Right? I'll spend $400 to get to uh, Vegas so I can go see some lights and leave some money and come back home. But gosh, when is the last time I got that excited about Christ? You know what I'm saying? Because you're a sent one. You've been sent by God if God has changed your life. Because angels live in a realm outside of time and space like God, Gabriel waited for 500 years before he was sent to earth to give the message to Mary that the time of Jesus the Messiah was now here. God is always interacting with the world both, both visibly and invisibly. It is the believer's joy to notice the work of God and join him there. You know what one of the greatest joys in my life is? Is when I lead somebody to Jesus. I mean, I've had a lot of joy in my life. I had a lot of pleasure in my life. I mean, things I bought times I've spent with my wife. I mean, I've had a lot of great times. But I can tell you, there's no more lasting joy, like a real joy, not just a happiness, like I'm happy right now for the moment, but a joy that's so long-lasting, like a long-burning flame in my heart, than when somebody comes to know Christ. When they come to me and they go, you know, my life's falling apart. What in the world can I do? And I go, you know what, Jesus can change who you are. All the external stuff can be dealt with, but you need to change what's inside first. If you can change what's in here, you can deal with anything. But you won't be able to deal with anything if you can't deal with what's inside. And only God can transform that through Christ. That joy is a joy that goes on forever. And for many of us, watch this. If you want to know true joy, bring somebody to the Lord. I know it's a little bit scary. I know it's a little bit like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. But let me tell you something. God has put people in your life that are waiting for you to ask them. How are things with you and Jesus? I don't even know Jesus. Good, because I'm here to tell you about Christ. I've been sent to you to talk to you about Jesus. When the Mormons show up at my door, I go, it's so awesome that Jesus sent you to my door today because I'm going to talk to you about God. <laughs> You've been sent to hear the gospel, to hear the good news of Jesus, that Jesus transforms lives. No matter where you go or what you do, today, tomorrow, next year, 20 years from now, you've been sent by God to people in your life. Are you doing the work of God wherever you are? You might hate your job. You might hate it. You roll out of bed, you go, I hate this day, Jesus. And guess what? Jesus goes, awesome, glad to hear it. Now get out of bed and go to work and tell somebody about me. Because guess what? You might be at the job you hate, but God has you there because of his love for other people at your job. And we have to be like Mary that says, behold, you're asking me to do something I don't want to do. You're asking me to do something, you're asking me to do something where you're wrecking my life. But I'm going to go do what you asked me to do. Not because I want to in my heart, but because you've asked me to do it because I love you more than I love myself. Lastly, number one is Gabriel is sent to Mary and number two is Mary submits to the will of God. When Gabriel arrived to declare the will of God to Mary, she was already legally married or betrothed to her husband Joseph. During the time of betrothal, which lasted about a year and served as a time of sexual purity, any violation of the marriage agreement could result in divorce and shame. And we, looked, we touched on this last week. Um, if you had a daughter and I had a son and... Uh, you and I, if you were the father of that family, you and I would get together and we'd write a marriage agreement and we'd say, your daughter is about this, my son's about this. And um, at that point, when the father signed that agreement, your daughter and my son would be legally married. But they wouldn't live together, they wouldn't have sex, they'd be celibate, but married, living separately, while my son got the house ready for your daughter he would start building a home. He would be working, saving money. Your daughter would be getting ready to be a mother, getting ready to be a homemaker, collecting things for the home. So by the time they got married, the home's up and running. Unlike our culture, where it's like, I'm going to go into debt 
So when we get married, there's going to be $400 million worth of debt. And I don't have anything to show for it except an old stereo I got to sell on eBay. <laughs> In Jewish culture, when the fathers signed that agreement, your daughter and my son are married. They work for one another even while they're apart. They have no bit marital benefit, but they're still working for one another. When they finally have a marriage date, when they finally have a wedding ceremony, now they can come together sexually. <coughs> Mary is found to be with child during their betrothal period where, they're, where Joseph and Mary are legally married, but now she's pregnant. Joseph goes, forget this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divorce her. The angel says, don't divorce her, it's from the Holy Spirit. He goes, okay, I'll take Mary's shame upon myself. Now Mary says, behold, I will do whatever you want me to do, God. And now the, the two of them now, they're both have, they, God has both them, asked them both to bear shame in their culture. But they are now going to bring about the Son of God. Mary is going to be the vehicle through which God uses her physical DNA to bring the God-man into history. Joseph, he is going to be the one to raise Jesus. He's going to choose to raise a son that's not his own because of his love for God and his love for Christ. Because they lived separately, Joseph and Mary trusted one another to remain virgins until their wedding ceremony. Once Joseph found out she was pregnant, he was hurt and thought about divorce, but an angel told him about the virgin conception of Jesus. As an Israelite, Mary had been waiting for God to fulfill his promises to send the Messiah. As a woman, she had been waiting to become the wife to Joseph and a mother to his children. As a believer, she had been waiting for God's will to emerge in her life. Though confused about the logistics of becoming a pregnant virgin, and despite knowing she would face ridicule, slander, and misunderstanding, she submissively accepted the call to follow God. Isn't that a teenage girl's nightmare? I mean, girls have a hard enough time if somebody like texts them like, I don't like the shoes you're wearing today. <gasps> Or like on Twitter or any of the other accounts, you know, they put a picture up and or you, she puts a picture up of herself, takes a little selfie. <laughs> she puts it up, somebody comments underneath it, you look ugly in that sweater. Or your hair, gosh, get it, get it did. <laughs> get your hair did. Because your hair looks bad. You know, you see all these comments under the picture? I mean, for a teenage girl, you, you just got to, oh, you know, life has come to an end, Right? Because one person, there could be 84 people that said, you're the most beautiful woman that's ever walked the face of the earth. But all just has to just take one person that go, you know what, you're super ugly. <laughs> you know, and all the 84, it doesn't even matter what they say. Oh, just, that one person has absolutely destroyed everything that's ever gone on in her life up to that point. Imagine Mary now. This isn't a Twitter account. This isn't any other like uh, social media. She's living it. When everybody goes, oh, you're one of those kind of girls, couldn't wait. She takes the shame upon herself to do the will of God. Joseph takes the shame upon himself to do the will of God. Ladies, all the single ladies, listen to me real quick. Ready? If you're single, lady in here, young ladies, guess what? Here's what I want. I want you to follow Jesus with everything you are. Amen. Here's what I'm saying to you, watch. You're going to come to a point in your life where you go, I'm super lonely. I just want some guy to love me. I want some guy to like me. I just want somebody to tell me I'm beautiful. I want somebody to tell me I'm amazing. And the problem is, is that if that's your standard, the first guy that comes along, you're going to fall for him. And he's, he's going to be a total jerk. He's going to be a total tool. He's going to be a, a guy that will not lead your family correctly. You're going to regret it because what you've done is you've lowered your standards from God's standards to whatever will make you happy. Young ladies, on the internet, I'm pointing at you. Out in internet land, guess what? You will regret every decision you make that's not done by the will of God. Young ladies, you be like Mary. That go, I will follow God no matter what he asks me to do. I'm going to choose a young man that loves you more than he even loves me. 
Watch this. If you just choose a guy that just loves you, that, that you're the apple of his eye and you're his whole world, because that's kind of romantically sometimes the way young ladies think is they go, I just want a guy that's just going to love me and I'm going to be his whole world. Guess what? The very first time something happens where you don't become that in his life and he goes, I hate you. I can't stand you. I'm so disappointed in you. I don't even want to be married to you anymore. Guess what? On that day, you were going to wish that you had chosen a young man who loved God more than he loves you. Because even in disappointment, you can get through anything that's difficult if you're following God first. Because people, watch this, ladies, ready? People will let you down. Young men will let you down. Young men will lie to your face. Men will manipulate you with words to get what they want. But watch, you won't fall for it if you have God's standards. Because you go, Jesus, is this the young man you want for me? Is, is his life, is the fruit of his life honoring to you? Would my father be pleased with this young man I'm looking at? And that's why I said last week, you know, the wife I choose for Caleb, I hope he likes her. <laughs> I hope he enjoys the young lady that I choose. Because I'm going back to the Jewish days, baby. <laughs> it's going to be parental choosing. Hope you like her. Because here's the thing, ladies. Watch this. At the end of your days, you want to be able to say you follow Jesus. Listen. You want to be like Mary, and you want to say, whatever you want, God, I will do. Because I belong to you. I don't even belong to myself. I don't belong to this young man. I belong to you, God. So whatever you want from me, I will choose a young man that loves you. I will not choose just a young man that makes me feel good about myself. Because Jesus has to be our highest value, not loneliness. Because when you make choices based on loneliness, you will choose poorly. Because it's whoever's available. Right? That was my sermonette to you young ladies in here. Though confused about the logistics of becoming a pregnant virgin, and despite knowing she would face ridicule, slander, and misunderstanding, she submissively accepted the call to follow God. True followers follow truly. Mary believed her life belonged to God, and at great personal sacrifice, she yielded up her body for God's glory. She didn't take on an attitude of disappointment, anger, and bitterness that God had wrecked her plans, but rather joy, peace, and the expectancy of God's plan. And that plan would ultimately be the savior of the world. Ladies, watch this, and I'm going to close. Ready? Mary could have said to the angel, could have said to Gabriel, because nobody's forcing her. Gabriel didn't come with a gun. Guess what? You're going to be pregnant. She's like, okay, whatever you need. Gabriel showed up and said, this is what God wants. Mary could have said, forget that. Forget that. I got plans. Me and Joseph, we got plans. We're going to have 28 kids. It's going to be awesome. We're going to live out on the farm. I'm a farm girl. I just love that stuff. I love the smell of manure in the morning, whatever. Mary could have had a million other ideas about her life. She could have said, you know what? I'm not interested in following that. But Mary, because she loved God, yielded up her own body for the glory of God. And you know what? We, you and I, watch how personal this is. Watch how personal this is. You and I are beneficiaries today of Mary's obedience. Because she got the privilege of bringing the Son of God into the world, who would ultimately save us from our sins, which is what we will celebrate at Easter. But before you can eat, watch this, before you can even get to Easter, you got to get to Christmas. And Easter doesn't happen if people at Christmas aren't obedient. Mary and Joseph at this time in biblical history are obedient to the will of God. Are you and I obedient to God's will this morning? Are you and I following the things of God? Do you and I think that we are following after God? Because all we have to do is look at our heart and see. This morning, my call for you is to follow Jesus with everything that you are. If you're not following Christ this morning, I invite you to do so. 
and say, I don't ever want to live that way again, God. I want you to be everything that I, that I want from you. I want to follow you with everything I am. Can you say that this morning? Because you've been sent by God to do the work of God. But it's up to us to be obedient.